Did yours work yesterday? Did we figure out? What was it? There was this very hidden privacy setting. A hidden privacy setting, all right. Well, good. All right, welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. Thank you, Bob. All right. Can I see everybody here? Maybe. Here's the nail skin here. No. Okay, well, we can just a little bit. Um, we start off, well, first of all, at the top of your activity sheet, there's a link that you can go to to get into our Canvas course. And the reason that you do this is just to get to the activity sheet, because on the paper sheet, the links don't work, but digitally, they do. Um, and also, at the bottom of the activity sheet, we've got a notes section. It's all editable by you all. And you can add resources and ideas and questions and such that you have there that we can perhaps get to. So today's topic is learning from and about students. Um, And it's kind of a broad topic because and it's somewhat unusual because we often don't think about and this might sound crass. We don't think about students when we do our teaching. Mm -hmm. We think about what is the what are the lesson plans, what are the concepts that I need to cover, um, and we don't talk so much about what do they want to learn, how do they want to learn it what are the best ways for me to present materials so that they learn it. Or if we do think about what is the best way, we think about a single best way for a generic or normal student, um, which is oftentimes not representative of the students who are actually in our classroom. Uh, and sometimes is, is harmful because we are representing a particular student rather than um, a variety of students. So. We should learn more about them in order to help them personalize their learning. Doing so in general means making connections with all of them, and that is not practical for many classes larger than, you know, 12 people. Today's topic, how do we do this? What should we do? Can we do it? What would you like to learn? Um, if you, if you go around the room and tell us their names and a thing that we would like to leave knowing, and then today we will try to address all of the things before we let you go. And that way it will be personalized and relevant for you. Kind of meta there. Anybody like to start? Lauren? Sure. I'm Lauren. I do language things. Um, so I guess I have. Two questions. One is, um, what are all of the ways that other people are asking these questions of students? Because I, I typically have seen it in, like when you send a survey or quiz or something, you throw in a question there. So, what other ways? And how important is the anonymity of the response that you're collecting? All right, Dan. Go for it. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm curious. You have required students um, to personalize content, but how do we do that? Um, so based on students and their own perspectives of life and experience, how do we connect our content to them more or broadly so that they kind of feel the importance of that? I don't know if that's really and it's easy to do on a one-to-one -one basis, but how do you do it? Maybe like 10, 12, 100, 500,000. Yeah. Very good. Tracy? Oftentimes, um, students feel so disconnected with the material. Yep. So if you get this information, 
and you've altered it in a way to personalize it. How do you inform them or share with them that, hey, I've changed things to hit what works for you? You know what I mean? Because sometimes they, they're so disenchanted, generally. And so how do you let them know that you've altered things to maybe tailor it to them or so that they can become more engaged? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, will often get feedback. Great example, student evaluations end of the semester, they fill it out and then they leave and they never hear from you again. You don't have time between the time that you see the results, which is after they left, to make changes for them. So as far as they know, it can be the same for the next four years. Well, they're sometimes not invested in leaving that feedback. Is right. Very good. Lynn? Um, yes, I teach in the biochemistry department. Um, I teach a lab course for seniors. And what's interesting about my students is that some of them have had years of lab experience in, a, in an independent research lab and are kind of experts already in some of the things that we do, whereas other students are new to those techniques. And so I try to think about, is there a way to sort of leverage when students have expertise? Um, I just, I love the, how to leverage student expertise. Excellent. Ella? Yeah, um, I'm a grad student in the Department of Geoscience, and I think all of my questions are already online. All right. Barbara? Well, I'm a student with the ISO, and there's a course on it, and Jason, and you covered everything that was on my mind. There's so, so many resources in this activity sheet that I just spend all day reading up with. Okay, thank you. All right. I work on a journal on the food access technology, and I've been primarily working with instructors that teach only online and blended courses. So I'm and now I'm working on learning all other part. So I'm kind of a step removed from students and hearing what others do. Um, I'm going to put that down as online versus face-to-face -face because I think that that's sort of an interesting topic. In face-to-face -face environments, we can be like, I've lost them. I can see by their expressions that I've lost them. In the online environment, you don't often get that feedback. How do you get, how do you substitute that feedback? JT. Um, I'm JT. Um, I'm interested in um, international students and addressing cultural differences that may or may not be present in the classroom. Um, and I would, I guess, second Lynn's question about uh, leveraging student expertise in the classroom. Coming from a partition structural background, there's often a wide range of speaking, reading, writing abilities in the classroom. So just sort of calibrating and putting you know, experts with nonsense. So for some peer-to-peer -peer learning. Very good, Dan. I'm Dan. I'm a colleague of um, many of the people in the classroom in grade 18, and I also do language things from the same <laughs> part. In my background, um, I'm trying to think of what I was going to say is different enough from what's been said so far. Um, JT just got in on my international student focus. I think what I want to take from with that as well is that I, um, I'm really curious and looking at my own practices and how to create an environment where international students feel that they can bring themselves to the room and that they are valid as themselves with their background in the learning environment and they don't have to try to imagine themselves a new identity where they're engaging like an American student would with the material. So creating that, um, uh, a, a space that builds on their strength, it builds on who they are and makes them aware that that's who they should be in the learning environment. Does that make sense? How to leverage student current identities? Yeah. I feel weird adding current in there. But yeah, where they, where they come from, where they add experiences, and add experiences to that as well.
Good. All right. There's one more that I was thinking of that I wanted to add, and now I've lost it. Not sure you come up. Big, big group, small group. Big group, big small group. group. Small group. Yeah, so, that's a good one. A lot easier to say than think. And that affects the kind of data that one can get, or the, the knowledge that we can get. So, so Kari and I are in the fellowship this semester where we are going out and talking to students about what are the things, how do they learn, how do they think they learn, where do they learn how to learn, what have they learned, and how has that changed between what have they learned about learning, and how has that changed from their first year on campus versus their senior year on campus as they're sort of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And looking back at yourself four years ago, what would you have told yourself? Um, what advice would you have given yourself about learning? And the first things that have come up, the, the biggest thing is, of course, time management and study skills. Learn how to study, learn how to manage your time. How many of us still struggle with those things? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, yeah, yeah, just some of these come, and then you'll be done and you'll be set with a life. But there are strategies that we pick up along the way that work for us that it may not be the same as other people. And this gets to individual differences. At the same time, there are um, clear trends in learning, learning science research about Distributed time, uh, distributed learning, where instead of learning everything about a topic in one week and then never visiting that topic again, moving on to the next topic the week after, that's mass learning, that's bad. They don't learn as much because they don't make as many connections to other things in their lives. But our option is to learn a little bit about something, learn a little bit about, about how it connects to something else at a very really small, superficial level. Then the next week, we're a little bit more, we make more connections. At the end of the semester, they've been making all of these connections, connecting all of their um, content in your class, and hopefully with their other classes, and hopefully also with the things that they see in their life, walking down the street, the places that they lived, getting back to body cognition that we talked about beforehand, and then making all of these applications where they start to see the world through their own particular lens. And the, and that's different from everybody. And if you think about your colleagues in your department who are similar to you, studying the same thing, same thing in quotes, you have much different ways of learning, of seeing the world, of approaching the world. There is no one way to do it. And you take that, and that's even within your own talk, in your own department of very narrowly focused people, in your own narrowly focused specialty. Now I think about your freshman introductory class where they are all over the board, so different from you. They don't look like you, they don't sound like you, they don't think like you. How can you reach those people? How do you find out about them? Is it even practical? In the past, we've often thought of, well, this is how we serve people out. Are you fit for college or are you not fit for college, right? And if you can't adjust the way that I had to adjust to get through my Ivy League school, then you're not fit for college and you should go be the, the, the hewer of wood and the drawer of water or carrier of water, or I forget what that, that phrase is, but yeah, go do tech school or something like that, go be a thinker like us. That's changing, right? Thank goodness that's changing because we've got a lot of people in a lot of our professions who look and sound exactly like us and we're not getting new ideas. <laughs> so if we start off by learning about what makes the students, what do they already have as far as their expertise goes, how can they connect your content to their current identities and their dreams, their ideas, their passions, their skills, um, their experiences in life, if we can make those connections, in many ways our job as an instructor is easy, right? 
because they will click on their own internal motivation, intrinsic motivation, and they'll learn everything that they need to learn about it and help us sort of have better conversations. They'll help each other for that peer-to-peer -peer learning because if I as a student say, well, I see it this way, and then I have a conversation with Lauren, I'm teaching Lauren how I see it, and Lauren's asking me questions that challenge my understanding of it, and so she's teaching me, and pretty soon you know, we've got a little cohort. Plus, I've also found a support person in Lauren because I've talked to her now, so I trust her a little bit, um, and it helps for, for learning to know that there's somebody that I can talk to um, or to study with or whatever. So all these things are good for the learners and good for our disciplines. How do you do that? What ideas do some people do already? That was one of the first question, right? How do we get student input? How do you get student input? I ask directly. Ask directly. That's jumping ahead a bit, but I'm going to leave it at the I like to keep my teaching as personalized as possible, so I'll go into the live sections and then the semester you have follow with them total. Mm -hmm. Just click between three days and I'll ask the students directly, like, well, how do you feel about this? What do you think we can say? Are there any glitches or issues that you're facing? What about my office hours? Would you like to switch? And by getting a broad feedback on that, then I can. So you're asking the class as a whole. You're not like one on one no, sitting he's, next to the guy. Sounds like you're going one on one. As they're working, you as they're working, I go in and inquire. Okay. About their experience. So you are one on one, and you're kind yeah. of yeah. asking them. Okay. What's the sort of big traditional way that we get student input at the end of the semester? Yeah. The, the emails, yeah. right? Yeah. And those are required by the legislature as part of our tenure package. We have to hear from the student input for that. So that's often all we do. And then we leave, or the students leave, and they never come back, and maybe we take their input if they gave us any input because, because it's not going to apply to them in their course because the course is over, why should I give you input? It makes sense. JT and then I do those actually mid-semester. Do you? For that exact reason, because I can fix things still. So you give them, but the official ones come out right, right. towards the end. Right. And right, so we can do surveys. This will be, I'm going to put E, O, Y for end of year. But then you can also do um, constant surveys. So right. At the end of the year, it's kind of too late to fix anything that would have helped those students. Why not help them all go there? And then Jay, to you. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're talking about it as well. It's a pre-semester survey called French and You. Um, it's just sort of what is your, especially for um, freshmen that are coming in, trying to figure out what are the range of experiences that they have had um, their background. So it's sort of what is your personal educational background? Um, what do you feel comfortable already doing in French if you have? A certain level of experience. Um, it's always they. We hope to have it always completed by the end of the first week of course, mm -hmm. um, to allow, I guess, to place students perhaps more appropriately um, across all. So it's sort of a uh, what's it called? Um, that's a placement exam. Um, that's sort of a preferences placement. I mean, but also very personal and asking sort of personal questions about your educational background. Okay. Um, and experience with French, but and so it's not anonymous. You, you can identify students. Are you able to share that with me in any way, or is it like some like the question? Just share the question. Yeah, I can get the question. That would be awesome. Thank you. And if you do, again, we have this resource page here that is open for people to edit. If there are resources you can add available for everybody, that'd be a good spot to put them. So yeah, we get into my um, teaching. Uh, Many of my classes, I would get, as a student, I'd get a 3 by 5 card, and the instructor would say, please add your name, what you hope to get out of the course, how many of you have seen this, you know, do you have a dog or a pet or something like that, things I should know about you. And then, presumably, they looked at that, and they learned what it was because of that. 
and I became a human in their eyes <laughs> um, by going to the hawk and dog. Dan, yeah. um, I, um, you would, oh, I would also add that there were some questions and also had some more content related and curiosity related questions where they talk about why they're taking the course, what they're interested in, what they want to learn, what things they think may be difficult, and so on. And I like to do feedback like that where you or do uh, evaluations like that or questionnaires like that. You bracket it so you, if you ask them at the beginning of the year, you ask them at the end of the, end of the, the, end of the semester, mm -hmm. maybe they have a, an ex that they're asked to look back at their own responses from the beginning and see like, what did you say then? How do you feel about that now? Yeah, I mean, it's also reflective practice, but it's it's good for me to see what their interest, where their interests lie, and, and how they express themselves at the beginning, and good for them to also look at where they evolve from the course. And you can do it not just at the beginning and the end, but and not just for your own reflection, but also for them as well. Do it every week. What have you learned this week, and how does it connect with what you said you wanted to learn? How many of you have ever been in a, taken a class where you had to take a class, but you didn't necessarily know what you wanted to get out of the class at the very beginning? But then as sort of the class progressed, you're like, OK, I can see how this is useful. Would it help if you were prompt throughout that course on how is this useful? How is this applied to your life? How is this connecting? to your dreams and passions and your pathways analysis. Yeah, similarly, I had an undergrad class where the professor would ask us every day, what do you want to learn from this class? And we would write down what the most interesting point of the lecture was and what the muddiest or least clear point of the lecture was. So that allowed him to hit on the least clear point during the next lecture. Um, and he knew what was interesting to us and to elaborate on that later. It also was a form of attendance, I think. The Muddiest Point Minute Paper, there are several of these sort of reflective tools, and I want to point out right now that we have a uh, fellowship on using active learning in the classroom. This is what's available on the sign-up sheet. It has activities to talk about how to do buzz groups, critical debates, round robins, and 30 other background knowledge probes, empty outline, Focus to this There's all kinds of things available for you, free, special offer because you came out today in negative degree weather. Congratulations. I have a question just to follow up. When your instructor collected those in the next lecture, did you see your feedback? Yes. You did? Yeah. Were, were there aha moments? Or, oh, sweet. You know, he definitely listening. Yeah. Or, yeah. Shoot, man, he didn't listen at all. The first thing we would talk about was like, oh, it's been like, well, we're really interested in this topic. Let's talk about it a little bit more. And how did they make you feel? That's just Did you feel better? Or make you feel better? Right. Yes. <laughs> if, 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 if you get this feedback, you can keep it all to yourself. It's a big secret. Right. Like, you know about, about you, but not to tell people who know about you. Then, yeah, it just feels creepy. And why not give that information back? If, 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 even if you reflect and say, I hear you, I'm not going to change the way that I'm going to do this, but, but I hear you, that's something. You know, ideally, I hear you, and there's room in my syllabus curriculum schedule to make some changes to address what you are saying. That's ideal. And this is all so I work in the athletic department, I work in academic services there. So I work with students that have learning challenges and are struggling to transition from high school to college or just, you know, college is hard, right? So I'm kind of, I, I teach in what I do, but I'm not teaching. I'm actually probably helping them work to understand or gain skills. Yeah, yeah. One of the things my students would say is like, Tracy, this is, this is awesome that the professor did that. But when we look at an evaluation, have it be a paper or an exam, the con you know, that may be side conversation of, hey, you found this interesting. They won't see the emphasis of that reflected in their evaluation, I mean, in, in their assessment. So the professor will be like, here's, you know, here's what's on the syllabus. This is what I told you to know, but we talked about that for 22 minutes and you didn't ask, you know, a question about. So that's where my students struggle is it's really interesting. And maybe there's a money thing, we talked about it, but and now I understand it, but now 
So it feels better. better. It doesn't happen. Or they'll say, well, we spent 20 minutes on that, and now we can't talk about that. So good luck. Oh, that's so great. great. Margaret. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Okay. So and then bring it back to the next day. It doesn't really bring back all the questions, not just the ones you want to respond to. Or they can watch your favorite questions. Well, right. You say, because all the questions we got are responding to some, but you need to say either I'm working on this or I'm out. You need to respond to every one. Sometimes those questions are sort of some uh, topic we haven't quite covered yet. And it's okay to say, good question, we're going to get to that in this module. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to follow up on, on absolutely, you know, everything. And I should highlight that this was at a, a small level art college, so the class size was like, like 15 or 20. So it's feasible. To it's, yeah. There is something. Okay. okay. Um, awesome. I was going to add, I, I teach my lectures usually about my new students, and I do ask for questions at the end of the lecture, and I'll put them on Canva as a Q&A so that I can respond to everything. And then if there's just like, if there are a couple that come up repeatedly, then I'll bring those up for next semester class. But I agree, I think it's important that if the students take the time to break their questions down, that they want to see the answer, uh, but it's not feasible to do them all at once. So I use it as a Sometimes you can, you can really gauge if the students are learning if they ask the right types of questions. And that's to your point. If you, at the end of the day, they should be anticipating the thinking and processing. You know, what's next? Wow, why are we doing this? What's next? And they should be asking questions about how does this fit into that? Yeah, they make those connections, connections is huge. Have you ever been, you know, teaching and then you say to yourself, they're not getting this. Because they're not asking the right kinds of questions. You know it intuitively when you're standing in front. They don't get it because if they got it, they would ask this question. So it's a good, it's a good instructor's, I don't know, radar. I think as an instructor, it's important to be cognizant of that because oftentimes you're exhausted at the end of the thing. You don't reflect on well, what happened and what didn't happen. If you can build in that time after every session to sort of sit down, take notes, one about the next semester or next semester class. But to help the next class and say, oh, so and so really look out of sorts. Maybe I should check back on the three by five card that I gave them at the beginning of the semester and find out if there's any clues on why they're doing that. Yeah. So I'm going to offer a different perspective on that, with, um, on whether it's important to respond to every question. Um, that's because I to help instructors to teach more for more than 800 students. And they were, we put off the idea of asking those kinds of questions simply because they felt I had to respond to everyone. It was as possible. And I do actually, in that in the course of you know, every semester, collect feedback from all those students. And it takes me three, four weeks to process it. So there's no way that I could get timely feedback to people based on, and no, no, no good instructor do that, um, based on you know, trying to murder through everything that they said. But, I, I, I also don't think it's in that kind of context that important because you know just through statistics you know we know that we don't have to do a complete hundred percent sample in order to understand the nature of the group. You can call and I, and I often say to instructors, well just call you know we've got two hundred four study and you read through them and give some aggregate feedback to the group and then and then you can also give them a chance to talk to each other about what they wrote. Now, that way they're getting come back from somebody. It's yes. new, but they are actually bringing that up to another person and building on it. And I think that those, you know, it, it, it is possible to do something from the obvious point where I'm curious about or deeper evaluation with a large group, but keep it within a, you know, a scope where you can actually handle it and give feedback. And the instructor shouldn't be afraid to do it. So, so this is where things like Piazza and having those conversations, they can be anonymous for the students, so they don't feel like they're asking them questions or 
how they themselves as, as asking a dumb question. They can say, oh, an average person asking this question. And then other students can go in and answer those questions for them. They can say, and they might say as their answer, the response to their question, I have that question too. I have that question too. I have that question too. Someone else can come and they say, I think it's this. Someone else is like, no, I see it this way. And eventually they solve those problems. They can get that feedback. And they're not sitting alone with that discomfort and uncertainty. And oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. I'm the only one who isn't getting this. Because you've given up them, you've set up this format for them to have a support group. Whether they want to name themselves or not, they name themselves. So, and this question may be coming up because I do a lot in, in distance learning kind of thing. Would, if you took some of the, the muddiest points that keep coming up and you made like a fact and an FAQ in your course shell, would students go to that? For the ask questions? Yeah. So, so my, my instinct is that yes, yes they would. More so if you had them answer each other's frequently asked questions. Okay. But they don't look at it on their own. I think that they look at it on their own because some students are sometimes desperate. They are desperate for, I don't understand this. What is going on? How can I get more information about what does the teacher want? And that's the big thing. So any insights into what the teacher wants, they give the frequently asked questions when you need to. I was thinking about this. I've got 200 responses. How am I going to handle that? Right. Kind of thing, but some of them may be similar enough yeah. that they could be answered that way. If you can draw the students to it, and that's, I have that problem with repositories when I try and collect repositories of content from instructors. They go there to find stuff, but they never go there to put stuff in it. Right, and so if I create, if I would create something with a lot of stuff in it, what's going to make the students go to it? Yeah. I, well, that's required. Okay. Uh, then JD Harry, I think. Okay. So then I'm wondering if you could just share. Um, I'm about the most large class, and how can you get to 200? Um, is this a way to create just a quick two question, you know, sort of survey the students with something that's more easily rolled up into a report? So if your learning objective for that day was topic one, topic two, and topic three. Is it okay to say, hey, everybody, on topic one, what's your comfort level? And just quickly, one, two, three, and, and just drop it into a report. You quickly get uh, a temp check. Not as detailed as a text field, but at least you have something. And then that can be a graded anonymous survey. So they get one point for answering it, giving them their comfort level. They get credit for it, we'll do it. And then it also gives you good feedback. It's easy to digest then because you can say, oh, everybody's at a one. Some of these three people, maybe they should just have a little side note about this versus, uh, oh, everybody that doesn't understand at all, let's do that session over again. Okay, okay JT, JT, and then, sorry. Yeah, I was just looking sort of uh, a question about experts in the classroom. Would you give a link to allow them to respond to questions? Or um, as simple as, just as a way to say, you know, like they answer them in class or they're responsible in some way for that? Because then I think you're also learning about students too and what they're interested in and how they engage with the material personally. I don't know what that's just about. Learning to make sure it's frustrating to have that like expert that blows the curve in the room. Although that sometimes you would think that they're an expert. Right? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, then. <laughs> so, and as an instructor, we also need to model that we are not always right. So that's, yeah, yeah. part of the course. Um, but yeah, we're, none of us are expert experts. We all make mistakes. Kari and then Dan. Um, I guess I wanted to think about how I've seen some really awesome um, teachers that teach large board online courses. And so they are doing a lot of um, data and finding out about their students just that they will never meet face to face. So. The discussion, a required introductory discussion that basically has some of the stuff that we get, and then the instructor responds to everyone to give that student the, hey, I am, I am here, I'm a person, I see that you're a person too, or required enough to, you know, to talk to each other. Um, but another strategy that I've seen an instructor do is really look at the, like, at the assignments, and, and then she'll do an announcement and say, hey, you know, like, 60% of you did really great on this thing, and then, like, 
we're looking for something we really seem to be struggling with it. So we're going to actually change what we're doing next week. So she's giving them real time feedback using some, whether it was quiz statistics or looking at an assignment that they turned in, but just doing some, um, you know, adjusting course and not on an individual basis, but just, you know, obviously addressing the class of our. So the idea of building flexibility into your course is really important and it's really difficult for large structured classes that have to cover X number of things in order to prepare the students for the next level class because the expectations when they come to the next level class, and I'm sure that you deal with this all the time, Dad, and, and reach. Um, I need to cover all of these things. I don't have time to make any changes or to pause and reflect and go back and cover this topic over again. How do we, what are some strategies for that? Okay, while you think about that, I want to talk about two other ways to get feedback from large groups of people. One is the student committee. How many of you have heard of classes that have a committee of students? So these students will be representatives and they will represent the feeling of the rest of the students and they can be a rotating group or they can be a continuing group, but five students, a class of 200, here are your five student representatives, tell them your problems and the five student representatives I will meet with and they will talk to me about your problems anonymously of course uh, and we'll come up with some things. The students have representatives um, rather than a sort of all, all against you. How are they chosen? How are they chosen? I don't know. I think that that probably varies. I know that they do that in nursing. I've seen it done in physical therapy. Um, the sciences where people care for people. Interesting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to point out the obvious. But... <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. The next one is called Small Group Instructional Diagnosis, SGID. Um, there's a, you can Google that term and there's a whole um, structured way to have a third party come into your classroom and take, and it takes a bit of time, but we only need to do it once a semester or once every couple of years, and say, huh, my course isn't working, my students all seem to hate me, what's going on, I'm not going to be here today, I'm having this third party person who they don't know, it's not the dean and I don't know, so it's not somebody who's evaluating my teaching. It's not somebody who's going to be in their, their instructor in the future. Come in and have a sit down, chat to chat. Um, what are the things that the instructor is doing well? What are the things they could do better? And you get some, there's a, one or two other questions. Very structured, the third party comes in, they do that, they go take the results, they not totally anonymize it, and they come back and they say, oh, you're just going to take away the U.S. this quiz question. So again, in nursing and PT are the two that I've been involved in. Well, also <laughs> um, Lillian and Tom used to do it with science across the STEM fields. Um, so I know that it's not, not just, just people who care for each right. other. It's not just people who care for each other. <laughs> So, so one of the, the things was, oh, I can, I can totally, totally do this. I had no idea that this was an issue. It's a small thing. She changed the way that she read, uh, asked the questions on the quiz. The students were like, oh, they're listening to me. They, they respond. Respect goes up, trust goes up, connection goes up, and the rest of the class is better. And then the next semester, the instructor starts off knowing already that the students hate this way that she lost, but it's no big deal. Allison, or wait, no, Dan, you had something to say. Yeah, that's okay. I can, I okay, can, Allison, probably several comments. So. Um, just as like an easy alternative, uh, a lot of instructors have TAs, and I think that it would it would be great for them to ask their TAs for the fact that the students are giving the TAs, but not necessarily the instructors. Does that make sense? I don't know if that's mm -hmm. very clear. But the TAs know a lot about what the students like and dislike about a class. So back to the very top thing, ask informally the students and the TAs. So this means that your relationship with your TAs needs to not be, needs to be good, right? Because they need to know that you will listen to them and you won't kill the messenger. And that is a challenge for some people. 
Have we thought about ways to wait, close my question? Dan. I want to follow up on your SGIP. Small group instructional yeah. diagnosis. I have, have not done that, but um, it reminds me how from the position of reach, I do get to read other people's evaluations and set them and read them. We set them together, and I go through and evaluate and create this kind of report that we use to guide what we're decision making around you know what how we improve the course. And it is definitely easier to read constructive feedback, which is sometimes destructive, but usually very constructive, and a lot of it's positive. When it's not for your own class and you're not yeah. actually invested in it, and then to really put that into perspective and say, "Wow, these these, these students who are criticizing the course are doing it in a way that it's saying, hey, this course is all right; it could be better." Yeah. And to have a really deep conversation about that and make practical changes. Um, now, the criticism is angry criticism. Some of it can be constructive, and if you're doing good, make it better. And because we work with teams, we have multiple structures reading that same feedback. And one of them is the actual level instructor. And I wonder um, if anyone has tried kind of evaluating, you know, two instructors evaluating their course and then swapping their their information to read through it and say, okay, this is what I see, this is what I see the students telling you, and have a conversation about that. Uh, Inter LS 300 is Terry Greenhouse, this is a course, and he, every fall, last fall and the fall for as a class at LS 300 where he's training students to sit in people's classes to give them feedback. Mm -hmm. Harry Brickhouse has paid a student for 10 years now to come in, sit in his class, and sort of be his personal troll. The students were doing this, you're doing this thing wrong, you're talking too much, you're not listening, you're whatever, you pay the student to give them that constructive feedback. And he says that it's revolutionized his teaching. And he's now training minions to go out and do that on his behalf, to just to go in and you can contact him and have him, I think, send one of his students into your course to sit in back and Come back and give you some feedback on it. I, I, say, I think that's a big disclaimer. I don't know exactly what, what the arrangements are for that. JT? I was going to say something a little bit to that. But, um, my experience that I had was actually with lesson study. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, that's that's really like, some of this one of the most, for me, one of the most formative things about uh, my graduate teaching was that experience. Team build, I mean, it builds a lot of stuff. Some of that. I guess the evaluation that you're referencing at the end of the, end of the semester evaluation. Oh, it's the semester. Mid semester. Ah, questionnaire survey where you guys want to get all the data. So, like, we're right. in the class long enough to really have a sense of it. And there's still time to change. Do you want to explain what that's a sentence to this group? Um, yeah, we put a, a blurb on it on the activity um, sheet. It's um, essentially a team based lesson that is designed by a lot of people who teach in the same section or they're teaching in the same department. Um, and the experience that I've had was four language TAs. We designed a lesson for French Kernel 2. Um, and we all participated in every step of the design process. Um, and we, one person sort of volunteered themselves to lead that lesson. Um, the three other people that were present were observers, but not of uh, the content itself, but about student engagement with the content. Um, so it wasn't an observation of the TA. Um, we're just more focusing on our students. Where does where does student attention start to draw away? This is a this is a type of activity that is actually useful based on your observations of their engagement with the course content. And then afterwards we. You know, debrief and not inform how we design the lessons of the team for um, the rest of the semester. And I guess that's a general statement. And the program itself. The next time we use where two, two teachers get together, they get them one lesson. One teaches it, the other watches, gives the feedback, and they redesign the lesson together. Second teacher teaches it the second time, and it gives the feedback and then they can finally come up with a final version for it. Like, 
Yeah, we kind of do that with the 201 course this semester. So it's me, the head TA, and then we have 12 essays. I have essays that were in the class as well. And it's not like me being a dictator or controlling all the outcomes of all the labs that happen. So I don't really know when people can look at essays. They want to see the students keep that class dynamic, never changing based on what they feel who they're a little bit more connected with the students than I am. And what they do is important or a good way of teaching what they found. You know, you know, problematic in the classroom in the previous semester. So, so, really like the, the, the instantaneous feedback that instantaneous feedback. This is a little bit off topic, but when you talked about having somebody come in and talk, not about, going, not about content of how you teach, but what student engagement is, and sort of the, the options on campus, and that this has been gurgling forward slowly, and we're almost at the point where. I know that there's a web page out, but I couldn't find it yet. Uh, pure feedback on teaching. Now, this is not pure feedback on teaching that tenure track faculty have to do for as a summative evaluation of their teaching to submit the part of the tenure package. That's a separate thing. This is are your students engaged with each other? Are they engaging with material? What are those sorts of things? You can have somebody come in and observe your classroom and Give you some feedback over coffee on that in sort of a low, uh, low branch, informal, non threatening way because it's not a person coming in who's part of your power structure, department of power structure. I wanted to say one more thing about the small group instructional diagnostics or diagnosis. It is um, it's consensus driven. So the students in small groups within your large class, you have hundreds of people, we're breaking into 10 groups of 10. And um, that group of 10 students has to come up with a consensus on the top five things or top three things in the, for each of those categories. And then the whole group has to put forward those things and vote on their top several things. So you get the most important things that everybody in your class agrees. We would love it if you change this, this, and this. You're doing this, this, and this. Great. And it's uh, it's kind of a nice democratic not the right word, but it's a nice student centered environment. This is new ish or this so, is new ish and um, I guess I'm wondering and maybe it's too early to tell, the people that are willing to participate, yep. are they the ones that really need it? Or is it the ones that don't want that aren't? Yes. You so, get what I'm getting at? <laughs> there's, there are questions about this um, being put forward by the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning. There are some instructors that their department has identified, huh, the students really hate this person, or they're doing a terrible job, job teaching. That, that person needs to have an intervention of sorts. Can this address those people? So, can we have these volunteer observers who are trained to do so, come into a antagonistic environment and say, oh, this is what I've seen in your class, where you're sitting there going, I don't want to be here. I'm forced to be here. And that's the thing that they're trying to figure out. Is it a volunteer person, or do we end up having somebody paid to sort of in crisis conflict management to be that observer? I don't know where that's going. Good uh, well, see, I do a lot of this. Right. Um, so you have an observation of the people who ask you. Well, yes, yes and, and no. no. I, what I've learned is certain people, I can give certain kinds of advice to them, they'll take it. Yeah. And they welcome it. And then there's other people I have to be careful about the way I give my advice yeah. because they're more. So but is that not true of any teaching environment right. and ever, and any student or, or any learner that yeah. you have to personalize? In, in my case, it's part of the policy of my program that they're going to get these observations to help them. And I frame the observation oftentimes related to technology, but it's really a pedagogical issue. Yeah, that's what right. I teach you And so when they have taken on the role of teaching in this environment, it's not optional. They're going to have me come in. And, and so that's why I was wondering, in a case like this where it's purely optional, are you giving the right people? Yeah, it's a question we're still working on. Yeah, I just want to come back to this the original topic of maintaining the learners. And yeah. I had um, 
promise them what we're talking that it was an assignment that we built into it was a fully online course, but then it was taken over to a face to face course as well. And it was basically a loading journal where a lot of the things that were student to student take their share type or an activity that they had to communicate over in class was also turned into a journal assignment. So it was a Google Doc with the question that they could, and then they had to respond in a few sentences to it. And every week they were required to do a certain number of these. And then by the end of the semester, this whole journal was filled out. And as the semester was going on, and we were going through the topic, the instructor was reading through you know, enough of them to get a sense of what students were saying, where they were struggling, what misconceptions they might have. And he would either, in the online course, he would deliver a letter of response to that. So a single piece of feedback to everybody saying, these are the trends, you know, this is what I've seen, and I want to talk to you about X. Or in the face-to-face -face course, he would write right into the classroom and give them feedback on it. And that was a, a really nice way of getting kind of continual feeling for how students were feeling about the material. And the questions were really diverse. Some of them were really content related, and some were much more around do you understand the use of this and you know, why is this important? Um, how can you connect this to the real world? It was a really interesting. And if you do that well, you have to do the basis of a project. So project based learning is a great way to have the students pick something that they find important, which as you read about it, you learn more about the students and can help. Um, Make, help them make connections. Um, they will continue to build on it as the semester goes on. Ideally, at the end of it, they're done, or all of that journal leads to everything that they need to do to finish this big final project that if they had just um, been assigned to that you know, two weeks before the end of the semester, they'd have to make that up. That's a great example of distributed learning where they keep thinking and reflecting throughout the semester on the topic. Great. Kari. Um, so a comment that kind of spans a few threads. I was thinking a little bit about what Lynn said, that she's got experts in the class, right? Yeah, and good. Also about the vulnerability of an instructor saying, oh, I want somebody to evaluate my teaching and yeah. my, my class, um, and how using evidence-based anything <coughs> instructors will listen to, right? So like in the online realm, there's something called All the Matters, which is a rubric. <coughs> An instructor, you can use it through the formal process of evaluation, or an instructor or an instructional designer working with an instructor can build the course to meet the rubric requirements, which basically says there's been research done on this, that students are successful in fully online courses when they have this great getting started orientation module, when the, they feel like their instructor cares about them. So just thinking that if there's a, whatever, evidence helps. And then even thinking about the students, um, again, this phenomenal instructor um, that I worked with, um, and we've also done some other work around this, but she basically said, okay, students in my course are successful. They told me they're more successful when they focus on these activities. And so this is how I recommend you work on this content. And this instructor actually said, when I was an undergraduate, and I, I was a first year college student. I didn't know anything. I didn't know about this power. So I'm telling you, this can be really helpful. Please come see me. And yeah. she was really good about bringing evidence in, bringing personal anecdote in, and just like, why does this matter? And why, you know, why is there? And in um, chemistry is part of their week zero module. They have people who have gone through the course, who struggle with the course, come back on camera and say, I struggled with the course. These are the things that I did to survive. And I ended up with this grade. So if you're struggling through the course, heed my warning. Now, if you say that as an instructor, the students will be like, whatever, you know, you don't know me, you don't know my life. But if they hear it from somebody who just last semester or two semesters ago took the course, they're like, okay, this person looks, sounds, acts like me. That might be the case. There are three more things I want to talk about. Anonymity, the role of anonymity, what is that? Good, bad, important, not important, different, dependent on the circumstance. I think it's important. I think it can be important. I don't think that all of your feedback needs to be anonymous. I think that giving the option for an anonymity is important. Um, one of the things I dislike about anonymity is I get good feedback, but it's not enough for me to be able to dig into. Um, so when I get that, I say, 
All right, class. I heard anonymously that this is a thing. Who can tell me more about this? Or if it, you know, doesn't have to be you. Somebody know what that's about. Help me understand it a little bit better. Um, if it's not anonymous, I can say, Lynn, what did you mean by that? Can you tell me more about that. And then I'm also making a personal connection um, with the other information. Um, yeah. I, I think it depends on the circumstances, but that oftentimes, you know, there are questions that don't make sense to ask when it's anonymous because you know you're not going to get an answer. It's right. you don't get it to you. And, and I, I think the, the place where the anonymity is important is if you're giving feedback to the whole group about what you heard, you don't want to any individual students. Yep. But uh, it can really help to know who is asking, who's having these difficult needs to help with a particular thing. And it also could help to. Okay. Um, cultural difference. I want to talk about that as well. What? How is this different from culture to culture? How can we uh, be aware of the different cultures? What are some safe, appropriate strategies for getting feedback from a variety of um, cultures? I don't know the answer to this one. Awesome. I put what I have heard as a good resource. I haven't actually read the book myself. I put it in the resource section. Um, it is a book called Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain. Well, has anybody heard of this or read it? Mm -hmm. So I, I came across this idea of culturally responsive teaching the other day. Um, I actually had a job application asking about my perspective on culturally responsive teaching. And so I had to do a little bit of research. Um, and that was one of the sources. Okay, great. I'm sure that there are others out there. Yeah. And I think that this is becoming more and more of a topic that people are paying attention to um, with different cultures, uh, different abilities, um, mental health issues. Um, how can we be more inclusive in general? Just in our teaching thus far, but I think a big part of that is also it involves getting feedback from students. Um, and maybe, I don't, it's, I, maybe it's allowing different venues to share that feedback. Um, I know some students that I work with, they're not going to voice something out in class if they're confused. Putting their name on it, they're probably going to fake their question. It might be some, they might need to know X, but they're going to ask Y because they're scared that mm -hmm. X is such a a basic thing that they would be embarrassed to have their name by that. Right. Um, so and we do the same it's thing. It's not authentic. In our business. But I can tell you from what I hear from my students is that they can tell those teachers that are invested in teaching and truly want learning to occur, mm -hmm. and those that are just teaching the class to do it, to get it over with, to get onto something more important. And I think those students that have those. The teach instructors that have those relationships or can make those connections, the students will only be open. So it's kind yeah. of getting at the root of what we're talking about. Building trust with your right. students and but I think allowing a different variety of ways to share that information. And that's the basis of the universal design yeah. for framework. Um, universal design for learning framework is multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression. So yes, can they do it online? Can they do it face to face? Can they do it handwritten? Can they do it in groups with other students and then report back? Can they do it directly in office hours? Or don't call them office hours, call them student hours. It sounds a little bit more welcoming. Mm -hmm. Don't have them in your scary office with all your books and your diplomas and stuff because that's intimidating. Have them in the classrooms. They're there all the time. They are more comfortable there. Don't do it individually. Do it in groups. That way they are the one person against the Powerful professor, but rather they've got a team the way that they do in class, things like that. Dan? Um, so I think one of the reasons I, I find this very challenging is because my background is in English language teaching and I'm used to working with groups of couple international students, often with one nationality at a time. Yep. And I am now in a, this more recently in context where it's mostly American students, with some international students, and they 
shock, culture shock of that shift for was huge for you. because of the way <laughs> international students behave when they let their guard down and be themselves in their own group compared to how they perform when they feel like they have to perform and have been judged in this group of American students. Yeah. And that's where I find it particularly challenging because also what I know works when I'm talking to a group of international students by themselves often to American students seems like it's crossing some sort of boundary that you don't talk to people like that. You don't, you know, you don't relate to international students like that because you're other and making them feel different within the group and so on. And so it, there's this strange dynamic that works out where everyone's trying to say, everyone, you're all the same, be all the same, don't bring any of that stuff that may, used to be you into the space because we're all the same. As we are now. <clears throat> and that's where I find this one particular challenge. Performance. From our opportunity. We are out of time. That's the last word. Um, on your way out, if you can check a few boxes, add a few notes if you'd like to. Um, again, if I'm presenting at that conference, so if you have any 